be a fun start this good morning everyone sorry we're still getting ready why don't you guys stand up i hope you guys are excited to be at church today not sleepy to be here today if you are wake up now so you can be ready to worship the lord with us this morning i think we're almost ready <laughs> there we go saw Satan fall like lightning, I saw darkness run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven, I believe in signs and wonders, and I have resurrection power. in heaven my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from death to life cause Grinch rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony the sons and daughters bought with blood and washed in water sing the praises of the spirit son and father my god will finish what he started my god will finish what he started this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. testimony from death to life cause Trish rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life cause Trish rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm this is my testimony. This is my testimony. Amen. We worship you this morning, Jesus. You are worthy. You are worthy, Lord.
mountains are still being moved and strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe, yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do, and bodies are still being raised, and giants are still being slain. God, we believe, yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. singing this song about miracles still happen. Giants right. are still being slain, Amen. even today. And I feel like there's some giants in this room. I feel right. like some of you bring in needs, bring in burdens, bring on things that weigh heavy on your heart right now. And I, wanna, I don't want to pass this moment up. As we sing this song about how good our God is, how powerful He still is even today, I want to take advantage of this moment that we have with Him. So if there's any one of you in this room who is hurting, who has a physical need of healing, a financial need that you need to lift to God, whatever the need may be, all I want you to do is just slip your hand up in the air right now. If you have a need, just slip your hand up nice and high. 
for those who have your hands down, look around at the needs in this room. I encourage you, go gather with them. Lift up the need, whether you know it or not. Let's join, the join together as the body that we're called to be. To lift up those who are hurting. The Bible says when one hurts, it goes throughout the body and we That's all right. hurt. So I encourage you, find somebody with their hand up. Lay a hand on them. And as the worship team begins to play, lift them up in prayer.
It says, when you have your way, something has to break. Tear down every lie and set the wrong things right. And I think far too often, we let the lies of the enemy creep into our mind and, and they take hold and they take root in our heart. And we start to believe that those lies define us. That he's never gonna bring the healing that we've cried out to him for, that he's never going to restore the things that the enemy's stolen from you, that he's never going to repair those broken relationships for that loved one who has walked away from the Lord. Satan is telling you there's no hope for them. And we start to let these things define our path and define who we are. You're never gonna overcome that grief. That sorrow is gonna define you for the rest of your life. That brokenness, that's just who you are. Your past, your sins, your failures, that's just who you are. But you guys, that's not who we are. We are redeemed, we are chosen, we are called. And what we need to do is give that to the Lord leave it there at his feet. So I want to challenge you guys this morning right now to lay it down. Don't pick it back up. It's not yours to have. It was never yours to have. And if you've been carrying it and dragging it for years, maybe choose today to give that burden to his. That is not what defines you. Satan, we speak against that. You have no place in this room. You have no authority over any life in this room. Jesus, you and you alone define. You and you alone call. Father God, may we rise up this morning to our purpose. May we rise to be children, children of the Lord, children of the one true victorious Savior. You are victorious, Jesus, and we are victorious in your name. No longer will we walk in doubt. No longer will we walk in shame. I want to speak to your shame today. That shame does not define you. It does not define you. Let it go. Let his joy begin to restore you today. Take back what the enemy has stolen from you. It was never his to have. Do not let him have your victory today. Do not let him have your calling today. Your God still fights on your behalf. Your God still has so much in store for you today. Keep crying out. Keep asking for that healing. Keep asking for provision. Keep asking for restoration. It will happen. It will happen. We stand on your word, Lord Jesus. We stand on your truth today, Lord God. We will not back down. We will not be beaten down. We will stand victorious and we will rise victorious today. I want us to sing that one more time. And I want, it to, I want you guys to sing it with everything that you have. Speak to your doubt, speak to your enemy, and then cry out to your father.
the space between where I used to be and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. That's right, there was another in the lone. He's holding it back, holding back the come on, church. Should I ever leave me not? Come on. You're free today, that's right. There is a cross that bears the word. Where another died for me, that's right. There was another in the fire.
your praise this morning. We sing your praise this morning. You are so good to us, Lord. Father, we thank you that in the midst of trial, that you call out to us, that you fight on our behalf. And God, we thank you for victory that is found in you today. Lord Jesus, would your peace, your joy, and your love flood this room. Let it wash over us today, Lord. Let there be no condemnation, no doubt, no fear. God, only your truth. And it's in your holy name we pray this morning. Amen. Amen, church. Isn't God good? Man, we are so excited, yes, to have you guys here with us this morning at Connection Church. Why don't you take a few minutes right now, walk around the room, and say hello to some new faces today.
gonna time you. Five, four, three, two, one. Get to your seat so I can make announcements. <laughs> I'm, I'm, making them, I'm making them sit and listen to me this morning. <laughs> All right, you guys. It's not very often that Matt gives me the opportunity to have the microphone, so he might regret this. Um, who in here loves food? Good, good. All right. Let me hear, at the count of three, everyone shout out your favorite food to me. One, two, three. Yeah. All right. Honestly, I had no idea what you said. But for the men in the room, you have an opportunity to come and eat some really good food, whether it's your favorite or not. It will be great. So we are having the men's breakfast on Saturday, June 12th at 9 a.m. here in the worship center. If you love food, if you love community, come to that. It's going to be a great time to connect. You know, even Jesus and his disciples, they... They ate together, right? They read the word together. They ate together. So this is the time to be the community, be the church of God together, and to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, right? Jesus knew, food, knew that food was important, and we do too here. So, man, don't forget that's June 12th. Um, Sign-ups are in the back. You can sign your name up just so they're prepared for enough food to feed all of you. Um, moving on. Oh, yes. Who here loves missions? Three of us, woo! <laughs> I, um, in my life, had had, have had many opportunities to go on different missions trips in the States and overseas, and Connection Church is giving you a chance to be able to serve the community. We are having a missions trip to Cleveland on July 30th through 31st. We're gonna have a brief informational meeting Sunday, June 13th, immediately following the service. If you're all, at all interested, um, want to find out more information, please go to that. That's not a saying like if you go, we're like signing you up and you're going to do missions. This is just something to give you information about what we're going to be doing, what it's about, how it's going to be um, happening. So no commitment, just come to find out more information. Sunday, June 13th. What day is that? Good job, you guys are listening, so proud of you. All right, who in here has ever been a kid before? I should see hands all across, ever been a kid? Some of you have not, I, I never skip that step. Sometimes I wonder if I'm still a kid. My husband thinks that too. Um, but we're going to have our VBS, our Kids Quest Summer Camp, June 21st through 24th. And we have a lot of little people that we are getting to minister and serve to. I can say I'm only where I am in my faith today because I had people who were willing to serve and teach me while I was a child. And VBS is a great time to do that. But we cannot do it alone. We desperately need more volunteers. Um, if you want to, we have signups back there. It's called Treasure. It has this huge, um, fun display. And I don't know what it's supposed to be, Aztec something, I don't know. But if you're willing to volunteer, we still need help, so sign up for that. Um, if you don't want to volunteer with your time, but you want to volunteer with resources, um, Lindsay has a bunch of these papers back there with things that they need. You can go fill one of those out. If you want more information about that, you can probably pull her aside at the end of the day and ask her about it. I'm not 100% um, sure how it all works, but I do know they have special needs that they need. Um, things bought for or donated. So pick one of those up on your way out um, and grab Lindsay if you have questions about that. With this, we're going to transition over to our time of giving. Um, when Matt asked me to do this, I kept having like something like laid on my heart to share. I'm like, I don't know if this really applies to giving. And I talked to him about it and then I, I read a little bit more and it's in 1 Kings 17 about Elijah and the widow um, as Zarephath. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bible college doesn't always teach you how to pronounce names correctly. Um, but here is talking about, about this widow who had a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil left, just enough to feed her and her son one last meal. And Elijah comes to her and says, God has told me that you're gonna feed me. And she's like, with what? I, 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 don't, have, I don't have enough to even feed my son and myself. But through this, she had to step out and take a step of faith and give the only thing that she had. And I found that sometimes in giving that, that's kind of scary for us too. And 
13, it says, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make yourself something for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel said. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. And you can read further and that's exactly what happened. Sometimes giving the little that we have will return blessing for us and we don't realize it. I know a lot of times for college for me, paying my tithe, I make so much little money sometimes in your college, but like this $20, you know, putting in the offering plate, that's really hard. But that $20, God will return and bless and make 200. And so sometimes we just have to step out in faith. Dear Lord, we just praise you and thank you for what you're doing. God, I pray a blessing over this offering. Lord, that you would bless it and multiply it in ways that we can't even imagine. Lord, that you would help us to step out in faith, to do what you have called. Lord, I pray over this message that Pastor Matt gives. Lord, that you would be with him and you would use him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The only reason I don't want to give her the mic again is because she's so much better at it than me. I've even started to practice the announcements and she's still way better than me. But that's all right. So... Welcome to Connection Church and welcome to what I am calling the first Sunday of summer. Yes, I know it's not officially summer yet, but I'm a youth pastor, all right? So I'm in the summer mindset. The kids are out of school, all the students are out of school. You guys are starting to plan some family vacations. Maybe you've already gone on some family vacations. We've already kicked off summer games in our youth group. We're having a lot of fun with that. We start to get into this, this pattern of the summer mindset. We start to relax a little bit. Maybe some of you out there, you don't get a summer break necessarily, but you like to take advantage of what comes with summer. You like to take advantage of the beautiful weather. You like to take advantage of the kids being out of school and plan those family vacations. We like to take those trips in the summer. So I am in the summer mindset. I was asked not too long ago, Matt, what's the best experience you've ever had? What was the best thing you've ever experienced? And in the 26 years I've been alive, that was kind of a heavy question to ask. I had to figure it out there for a second. So I had to answer with my Boston trip, the trip I took to Boston. I did an internship out there in 2018, and I had a lot of fun with it. There were some really great times, and then there were some... Eh, not so great times. And you'll get to hear a few of those if you haven't already. But I did everything you can imagine in Boston. I took a boat tour like out and around the Charles River. got to see the whole city from there. I tasted the original Boston cream pie, like the first one ever made. That was incredible. It was $17, but it was incredible. And then I took a, I even took a pirate ship out and around the harbor. And I took some uh, breakfast, some English breakfast tea with me and dumped it in the harbor while I was on the pirate ship. So it was a lot of fun. I had a blast in Boston. But I went out there for an internship, and I told them when I went out there, I don't want to be in youth ministry this year. I've been in youth ministry for 10 years at this point. I want to break out. I want to find something new. I want to look at the church as a whole. So they put me with the executive pastor, and I got to follow around the executive pastor that entire summer, 10 weeks of following him around. I got to learn a lot from him. Except when you're following around the executive pastor on a Sunday morning, it's really not all that fun. Basically, all you do is sit through the same service three different times. And if you know me at all, I don't have an attention span that long. Like, I'm lucky if we get past a 30-minute message. If I'm hitting 35 or 40 minutes, like, that's a great day for me, especially being up here on a Sunday morning. I don't have a long attention span. So I would sit through one service. I got my worship. I got a great message. I was good at that point. But now I want to go branch out. I want to find a different area of ministry to get into. So... I got very acquainted with the children's pastor there. We were, we were a great team. I liked her. She liked me. I don't know why, but she did. And we worked well together. So I ended up helping her out in kids ministry. Now, don't get all surprised that Matt was in kids ministry. Really what I was doing was like tech stuff, you know, running our, the PowerPoints and all that sort of stuff, helping her with check-in. I actually really enjoyed the check-in part because I got to talk to the parents more than the kids, but I enjoyed that side of it. But then there was this one Sunday. And I remember this because it was a very, very dark Sunday. They called me and they said, Matt, you're needed down the hall. And my heart sank. So I turned the corner and I start walking down the hall to what was known as the, wait for it, the toddler room. <laughs> they said, we need help in the toddler room. Oh, get the intern. He'll do it. He'll love it. 
Yes, I'll do it, but I did not love it. I walked in and it's like mass chaos in this room. Kids are like running around as fast as a two-year-old can. They're throwing things across the room. They're screaming, they're kicking, they're crying. They're doing everything you can imagine. At one point, I think I even saw a kid jump over a table. How a two-year-old jumped over a table, I don't know, but I think it happened, all right? Like this room was absolutely insane. But I did get to learn something from these two-year-olds. In this room where terrible twos took on a whole new definition, I learned something from them. You see, these two-year-olds, they operated with almost a first-come, first-served basis. Like the first one, whoever was lucky enough to have their mother or their father bring them to church first, they got to pick from all the toys in the room which one they wanted for the Sunday. Was this a teacher rule? No, of course not. This was a child rule. They picked out their toy and they marked their property with it. They marked their territory. And how does a two-year-old mark its territory, you ask? They drool all over it, everywhere, like on the toy, on the table, next to the toy, everywhere. This was their toy for the Sunday. I'm certainly not going to take it from them covered in drool. They're not going to share it with another two-year-old. No, no, no. This was theirs. This toy had value to them. And they claimed it. That was their toy for the whole Sunday. Now, sure, they had other toys at home they could go home and play with, but this toy was different. This toy they didn't have at home. This toy had value to them. They claimed it as theirs. And you know how a two-year-old, if, if you're a parent in the room, you know how a two-year-old acts when they claim something as theirs. They get into this mine mentality. You know, they pull it close to them. They protect it. It's mine. Now, I thank God that we have matured since that point. And I have not seen anybody in this room act with that mine mentality and, you know, mine. I've never seen anybody in the room do that. Okay, I've seen maybe one or two, but I haven't seen most of you do this. We don't act with that mine mentality anymore, but yet we still act like a two-year-old in some ways. We hold things very close to us. We value things. We set things in our life that are of high value to us. Ever since we're asked the age-old question when we're young, what do you want to be when you grow up? We give the random answers. I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a pilot. I want to be a scuba diver. We craft these wild visions, these wild jobs in our minds. Now, I don't know of any professional pilots in this room. I don't know of any professional scuba divers in this room or maybe a firefighter or two. But most of us, we grow out of this mindset of this is what I want to be when we grow up. And that vision, it crafts, it changes, it molds as we do. But ever since we're asked that question, we start to craft a plan for our life. We start to craft ideas of what do I want to be when I grow up? What do I want to do? And these plans, they become of value to us. So much so, we hold them so close, we we act like a two-year-old. They're mine. It's my plan. Nobody can change it. Nobody can mess with it. This is what I want to do. This is where my life is going. This is my life. And then as a teenager, we get that first paycheck from McDonald's or Wendy's or wherever you worked at the time. I worked at Dunkin' Donuts. It was not fun. But we get that first paycheck. You know, the whole $11 you get. And you... That $11, although it's not much, and of course, okay, mine was a little bit more than that, all right? Mine was like $12. I, I only worked one day at Dunkin' Donuts, like it was horrible, but that one, one day of paycheck, that had value to me. That was my money. I worked so hard for it. You know, flipping the sausage on the grill, that's all I did. But I worked for it, this is mine. I'm going to spend it on whatever I want. Even though we grow out of the two-year-old mentality and we don't claim little toys as mine, we still have things of value to us. Whether that be the money we have coming in every week, our paychecks, maybe it's the plan, mine certainly was, the plan that I crafted for my life. I had it set in stone, this is what I'm going to do, I'm good at it and I like it. Ever since my mom told me, When I was a little kid, as I was ripping apart my sister's toys and building with connects and Legos and all these things, she's like, you're going to be an engineer, aren't you? And I said, yeah, yeah, I am. Ever since that day, I was crafting this plan to be an engineer. That was my plan. 
and I was good at it. I loved it. Through high school, I was at engineering firms talking to different engineers. I was working for this. I loved what I was doing. I loved what I was building. Until that day came and God said, I need you to be a pastor. And if you've heard me talk about this before, you know that was not an easy call. No, I argued with God. And why did I argue? Because I had value in my plan. I wanted to protect what was mine. This was my plan. This is what I designed. This is what I wanted to do. It's mine. So for four months, I argued with God on it. Back and forth we went, you're going to be a youth pastor. No, I'm an engineer. I've worked hard for this moment. This is what I want to do. And finally, as arguments with God typically go, I lost. And I realized, fine, if you want me to be a pastor, you got to do it, because I can't do that. We like to craft what is important to us. We like to hold close what has value to us. Maybe that's the plans and the ambitions we set in our lives. Maybe it's the paycheck and the funds that we work so hard for. Maybe it's even our family. We would certainly never let anything come between us and our family because they have such a high value to us. Even though we're not two-year-olds in the toddler room pulling toys close to us saying, this is mine, we still do it, just in a different way. We like to hold our plans close. We like to hold our money close. We like to not let anybody come between us and our family. This is my family. I'm going to protect it. This is mine. And we get into this mine mentality. Anna, can you bring my water up here, please? Sorry, my mouth is getting a little dry. So if you have your Bibles today, I want you to hold them up nice and high for me real quick. Phones or, I count phones as Bibles, hold them up. There you go. All right, I like it. So I'm going to be preaching out of one verse really today. Now don't get too excited, I'm pulling in other reference verses, so it's going to be a little bit longer than a one verse message. But I'm really preaching out of one verse, and I don't really care for you to jump around verse to verse with me. I want you to stay in this one verse. I want you to focus on the areas that I'm talking about. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. All right, let's do that again. (laughs) I don't do the whoop whoop thing. That's a Pastor Tom thing. But, you know, we'll respect him, all right? So if you have your Bibles, give a loud Connection Church shout as we turn to Romans chapter 12. (laughs) I really think you guys respond better when I do that than when he does it. (laughs) He's not watching online today, so I can say that. (laughs) All right. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It starts off very simply, therefore, I urge you, and we're going to stop right there. Therefore, I urge you, I want to talk about this. I love the way Paul writes his books. He's very intentional and he's very literal in his writing. When we see the word therefore, we first need to understand what comes before it. So let me just say right now, the beginning part of the book of Romans, chapter 1 through 11, it talks about the saving power of the gospel. It talks about the purpose of why Christ had to come. It talks about why he died for everyone, not Jews and not Gentiles, but everyone alike. It talks about the great, impa- the great power that came from Christ on the cross. This is how the whole book of Romans starts. It says, because Christ did this for you, because he loved you so dearly that he was willing to send his son and die for everyone, he says, therefore, I urge you. Now, when we see the word urge, it's very important to take recognize, to recognize that verse, to recognize that one word. Because when Paul says, I urge you, he's not, he pronounces that word very strongly. He's not simply asking us to do something because oftentimes when we're asked to do something, we tend to push it off, right? We tend, we tend to forget. How many of you have ever been asked to do something? And it's not that you didn't want to, you just simply forgot to do it. Maybe you didn't want to. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, teach me how you do that because I would love to. Like, you get asked to do something, we just naturally forget. I, I had a meeting set up with one of our youth leaders not too long ago. 
And he comes to me a couple days later and he's like, I need to apologize to you. I've completely forgot that we asked to have a meeting that day. Luckily, it was no big deal because he forgot and I forgot. We both forgot what we were asked to do. But we don't take notice of ask very often. Like I said, I'm a youth pastor. When I told the students about this, you know, I use the analogy when we're asked to take out the trash, we tend to push it off, right? When I'm done with this show and then we never actually go and do it. If you're asked to clean your room, you can just forget about it. It doesn't actually happen. But when we're asked to do something, we tend to not think too much of that and we push it to the back of our minds. Sometimes we do, but most of the times we forget. So Paul couldn't simply, he couldn't say, I ask you to do this. He says, I urge you to do this. And after Paul just got done explaining the power of the gospel, the freedom we have in the name of Christ, he couldn't say, I command you to do this because what freedom is there in a command? What would it be if Christ said, you're freed by faith, but now I'm commanding you to do these things? There's no freedom in that. There's no love in that. So Paul couldn't command us either. He says, no, no, no. I urge you as strongly as I can to do these things. I urge you. This is a turning point in all of Paul's letters. We have turning points in our lives where it's time to to maybe grow up a little bit, if you will. I came to a turning point just the other day. Anna and I went to Sky Zone for her birthday. If you've ever been to Sky Zone, it's like a giant trampoline park. There's dodgeball trampolines like up on the wall and stuff. We, there was like a tra- trapeze thing into a foam pit and all this stuff. We're having a great time with this, right? Until I get on the trapeze. And I get on the trapeze and I, I hold on. And first of all, I just fell face planted right into the foam because I didn't realize I had to hold my body weight up. Now, granted, this thing is made for kids, so I'm like standing up on the ladder like this, like squatting. But I'm holding myself up there. I drop down, and I'm like, okay, that was embarrassing. Let me try again. So I, this time I hold my weight. I swing out. I drop down. And as I get out of the foam pit, I realize, like, my forearms are hurting. That dropping motion from the trapeze into the foam pit, like, tore the muscle in my forearm. And I realized at this moment, I'm not the 20-year-old kickboxer that I used to be in college. I'm 26 now. I'm a youth pastor. I'm sporting a dad bod. It was a turning point in my life. I realized maybe I should grow up a little bit. But like I've said repeatedly today, I'm a youth pastor. That's probably not going to happen. But that's a turning point. This is a turning point in Paul's letters. I urge you. He says the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. There we see that terminology once again. I urge you. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. In this, in this verse, when he says to live, it more accurately translates to walk. And I like the term to walk just a little bit more. Because when we think of living a life, that's a very broad term. That's a very broad timeline even. We have our lives to make an impact then. But when we hear the term to walk, we can point to that action. We can see it visibly. If you've noticed, I'm a little bit different than Pastor Tom. I don't stand in one spot behind the podium. I've never liked podiums. I feel like they box me in a little bit. I like to move. I like to be free. I like to walk end to end. You can see the action of walking. And it says to walk in ways worthy of the calling you have received. This same term to walk is used in 2 Kings verse 20. Make sure I get my reference right. 2 Kings verse 20, verse 3, or chapter 20, verse 3. As Hezekiah pleads for his life with the Lord, he says, Lord, remember how I have walked before you. Remember how I've walked in these ways. Remember what I've done. I like the way that Paul says, I urge you to walk in these ways. Walk in the way that you were called to walk. Live in the way you were called to live. So we take notice of that in Romans. Once I find my verse again. 
this is the problem when you preach multiple different passages. I like to jump around in my Bible. I don't just write them out in my notes. So you just got to bear with me switching back and forth here. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. You guys are a little bit ahead of me. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, of view, in view of God's mercies. Now let's understand this section. The mercies of God, they were often thought as the backbone in the Old Testament to understanding the unconditional love of God. Time and time again, we see the mercies of God come over the Israelites as he leads them out of Egypt, as he provides for them in the wilderness, as he provides for them and fights for them, as they conquer city after city. We see the mercies of God show up over them. We see this unconditional love of God for his people develop throughout the Old Testament. And the mercies of God, they were the backbone to understand how deep that unconditional love goes. As I said, Romans 1 through 11, it talks about the mercies of God. Paul pulls in this theme that he has already talked about. You were saved by grace. The grace that Christ had for you as he bore your sins on the cross. That's the reason you were saved. But that's only step one. It's only one thing to say you believe in the name of God. It's one thing to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. But now what? But there's got to be something more than that. As it says in James, even the demons believe in the name of Christ. There's got to be more than that. And this is where we see Paul now. I urge you then, in view of God's mercies, don't forget about his unconditional love. Don't forget what he did for you on the cross. Take that with you. And now we're achieving our next steps. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you, in view of God's mercies, to show, excuse me, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. So now we move on to the second section here. We talked about the mercies of God. We talked about the importance of what Paul is asking us to do. And now he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Sacrificing, it wasn't uncommon for the people in Rome. In fact, sacrificing is presented in almost every ancient religion. It's drawn out quite literally in the book of Leviticus. These sacrifices day after day would have to be presented to the high priest. They had to be perfect. These people, they would have to choose the perfect male from their livestock. This animal had to be perfect. It couldn't have any defects, no limps, No tufts of fur bitten out. It had to be as perfect as it could be. So much so, in fact, that the priest would even wash these sacrifices before he presented them to God. And he would present these sacrifices. And for myself personally, and maybe for many of you, I don't think we understand quite the impact that this would have had on those people. Presenting these sacrifices. Now, I'm from Kansas City. I didn't know people actually owned livestock until I moved out here, okay? That just wasn't a thing in Kansas City. When we saw a cow, we're thinking brisket, let's go. I didn't think of actually an animal out in the pasture. When I saw one, it didn't change my feelings. I looked at it and I said, ooh, that looks delicious. Can't wait to eat it. But these livestock, they were their currency. They were their family's source of food. These livestock meant so much more to these people who couldn't just go to the grocery store and buy a ribeye steak. These livestock were very, very important to them. And to take the perfect one, to take the one that you're saving for a guest, to take the one that meant most to you and go and sacrifice it, that had to be a source of pain. These sacrifices had such value to them 
I can't help but think of Abraham in the book of Genesis. As he gets the call from Lord, I need you to sacrifice your son Isaac, your one and only son Isaac. The pain that he must have felt as they walked up the mountainside to let go of this one thing that he has been praying for, longing for, desiring for so long. God says, I need him. These sacrifices, they weren't often the easiest of things to do. They held pain there. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, again, make sure I get my references right. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, it says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice. But notice how it ends, ends here. He offers the same sacrifice that can never take away sin. These sacrifices, as painful as they were for the families to give up, they were merely temporary. They couldn't take away the everlasting sin. They couldn't give them everlasting hope. These were merely temporary. So time and time again, they would present these sacrifices that they might be an atonement for their sins, that they might. The pain they must have felt to do this time and time again. But Paul says something else. He says, no, present yourself as a living sacrifice. You see, when Christ was on the cross, he changed the definition of what it meant to sacrifice. This was no longer a temporary measure. This was something that would revolutionize sacrificing because Christ was the one and true sacrifice, the perfect lamb for not just the Jews' sins, but for the Gentiles as well. When he died on the cross, he died for every single one of us. Christ showed us what it meant to truly live as a living sacrifice. As he died on that cross and rose again three days later, he changed what it meant. And now Paul says, just as Christ did for you, in view of his mercies, present yourself now as a living sacrifice. Because of what he did on the cross, we are now called to be a living sacrifice. And I want to switch over to 1 Corinthians 6.19. As we see this parallel come up, it says, Do you not know... Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God. You are not your own. No, you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It draws it out just a bit more for us here in 1 Corinthians. He says, you were bought with a price. In the pagan culture, it was common for their gods to dwell in their temples. So now likewise, Paul takes that, that thought and he says, now you become the temple for the Holy Spirit. Because of what Christ did for you on the cross, how he set you free, how he bought you with his blood, we're called now to present our bodies as a living sacrifice for his name. I urge you then to present your bodies as a living sacrifice because of what Christ did on the cross. And let's not skip past the part of the Holy Spirit. I think of the ministry that Christ did. Everything that Christ did, and I think how could anyone measure up to that? But as he tells his disciples in the book of Acts, wait in Jerusalem, wait in Jerusalem for the gift that I'm going to give you. And it was through the gift of the Holy Spirit that he crafted his disciples. 
He showed them what it meant through the work of his spirit to become a living sacrifice. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. He says, your life is not your own. Because you were bought with the blood of Christ, because you were bought at such a high price. Now we're called to present our bodies, honor God with every part of ourselves. And then as we took, turn back to Romans for this last section, don't get too excited just yet because I still have a little bit more I want to talk about. I usually don't worry about time in here. I'm usually pretty well within the threshold. So as we turn back to Romans chapter 12, I want to finish up this verse. We've talked about the importance of the word urge. How we take the mercies of God and we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And it says this at the very end. This, this is your true and your proper form of worship. Out of everything that I've talked about, it's mirrored almost perfectly in 1 Peter chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. I really like Peter as a leader. Peter was much like you and I. He was just an average man. Peter made his mistakes. But yet Christ still said, Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. And as Peter writes, he says, above all, love each other. That's where this whole thing starts. That's where it all starts to become a living sacrifice. It starts out of love. It's the second part of our mission statement here at Connection Church. The first is love God. The second is love people. It's the second core value that we hold in this church very closely. It all starts with love. And through that sacrifice of loving everyone, through the sacrifice of loving each other, he says that, that kind of love it has the ability to cover over a multitude of sins. I feel like oftentimes when we put our offering in the plate or when we go to an event and volunteer our time and sacrifice that time, it seems so often that we do it and we move on and we never see what God actually does with that. But we don't need to see what God does that because we have faith that he's doing what the body needs. We have faith that God is working through that sacrifice. Like Anna said, that he's going to take that little bit and multiply it, bless it to the kingdom, bless it to the body. Peter continues on, he says, Offer hospitality to one another and do it without grumbling. As I talked about at the beginning, we hold these things very dear to, our, to ourselves. We like to hold things of value to us, whether that be our plans or our money, our time. We like to hold it close. But Peter says, offer hospitality, offer it up without grumbling. Peter and Paul, they, they understood that it was not the easiest of things to sacrifice. It was not easy to give up what they had. Peter should know that more than most of us. Jesus was walking around along the Sea of Galilee and he calls to these two men in the boat, hey, come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. They questioned nothing. They left their boat, they left their jobs, they left their lives, their homes, their families, they left everything, and they followed God. This man, they didn't even know. But because of the prompting, 
of the work of the Father, they said, all right, let's go. I relate in just a small way to that. Very, very small way. It was one thing to leave the career that I worked so hard for in high school, mind you. I thought I worked hard for it at the time. I really didn't. It was one thing to leave this passion of mine behind, this passion of math and science, building, crafting things with my hand into a career of reading, writing, and studying, and preaching. That was one thing. But if it wasn't enough, God, after I graduated from college, he says, now, Matt, go to Wooster, Ohio, as I thought it was said. I'm like, what's in Wooster? I have nothing out there, no friends, no family, nothing. But yet this is where he called me to be. He called me to leave everything I knew behind. My friends, my family, everything that I had worked for, he said, leave it behind and go do what I'm calling you to do in Wooster. I'm a Kansas City guy. I'm a Kansas City guy. I love barbecue. I love walking around the city, the concrete under my feet, the sky, skyscrapers next to me, finding every single coffee shop I could possibly find. I loved it. Every barbecue joint you could imagine. And I'm talking good barbecue, not like how, you know, North Carolina barbecue. I'm talking real stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I loved it. But God said it's time to leave. It's time to leave it all behind. I don't want you to think that I know what it means to be a living sacrifice. This was one of those messages as I'm preparing, God taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, are you listening? Are you understanding what I'm telling you to say? Are you understanding what you're writing? This is one of those messages where God hit me hard and I'm preaching to myself just as much as I'm preaching to you. Don't sit there and think that this pastor has it all together because he doesn't. I'm getting to the point now where I even look at many of you and think you guys need to be teaching me. There's many in this room who know what it means to be a true living sacrifice, to drop everything just to answer a call. I'm slowly getting there. I'm just like you. And God was speaking to me through this message. This message about what it means to truly be a living sacrifice. To get out of your own way. To give up what you claim as mine to give up your dreams, your passions, to give up your financial goals, to give up even your families, to answer the calling you have received. It was never meant to be easy. Sacrificing was never supposed to be an easy thing. But it's so important. That's why Paul in Romans he says this as a turning point. He says, great, now that you have accepted Christ, now that you've taken that first step, now that you understand the love of God that was portrayed on the cross for you, now that you're done with that, here's what's next. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. And back in Peter now, he says, each of you should use whatever gifts you have received. Use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of grace in various forms. Once again, we see that terminology kind of that Paul used. As, says, as Paul says, in view of God's mercies, Peter then says, he says, if you use these gifts, if you use what the Holy Spirit is doing in you, if you follow that calling, that's what it means to be a good steward of the grace of God. 
to not keep it for yourself. Yes, you've been saved and that's great. But now what about everyone else who hasn't yet heard this gospel? What about everyone else who still needs to find out what that unconditional love is really like? What about everybody else? As Paul wrote in Romans 1, this isn't just for the Jews anymore. This is for the Jews, the Gentiles, and everyone alike. It's not up to you to determine who gets to hear the gospel and who doesn't. Your job is simply to share it to everyone. To be a good steward of the gift of grace. It's something that we can't hold as ours, claim as mine, because the grace of God was big enough to cover everyone. He says, use these gifts. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one who speaks the words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're all given a gift. And I wish I had the ability to tell you what your gift was. That's not a gift that God has given me. But he's given us a gift. And now Peter says what it means to truly be a living sacrifice. It means to use that gift in every capacity that you possibly can. We like to hold these things as mine. My plans, my dreams, my passions, my money, my family. These are mine. But what it really means to live as a living sacrifice, it means to give up everything that you thought was yours. Just as the disciples did when they left the boats, saying goodbye to their friends, their families, everything. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus even says, if you wish to be my disciple, you need to be willing to take up your cross daily and follow me. This isn't a temporary measure anymore. Sacrificing isn't a one and done type of thing. This is a continuous. This is a way of life. To live that life worthy of the calling you have received. We need to be willing to give up every part of ourselves. What does that look like for you? Maybe it means you give a little bit more in the offering next week. Maybe it means you give a little bit more to free to dream. Even if your pledge is already done, maybe you give just a little bit more now because God is prompting you. He says, I'm not done with you yet. For many, maybe it's our time. We have various different places here at Connection Church to serve. We have various different trips coming up where you can serve, whether that be VBS or the trip to Cleveland. Maybe it's finding your spot here at Connection Church. Where do you plug in? Where do you fit? And like Peter is saying, he says, we all have gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit. We wanna play to your gifts. If you don't like to talk to people, we're probably not going to put you in greeting. That's probably not your wheelhouse. But okay, you can't greet, but maybe you can run a computer. Maybe you can make coffee. Maybe even you could teach. We have various different places. And as the church begins to grow, as we want to reach more people, as we want to do more things, Pastor Tom and I dream almost consistently now about what we want to do when Free to Dream is done. And there's plenty more areas coming, but some may not even be in our minds yet because you haven't come forward and said, this is my gift and this is what I want to do. You see, the power of the church is working as a body. We're doing okay, but imagine how much better we would be if every single one of us in this room used our gifts. 
imagine the capabilities of what this church could do if we use the gifts that God has given us, if we use the time and the resources that we have at hand, we would definitely see what it means to break out of the walls of the church, what it means to reach a community. As Anna said, we have VBS coming up, a great opportunity to reach new families, to reach new children, those who have maybe never even heard the gospel before. And you think, well, Matt, I'm not good with kids. That's great. Neither am I. But can you make some snacks? Maybe you're not great with kids, but could you, could you help lead the teams? Tell them where they're supposed to be and run a schedule. <laughs> Once again, there's tech needs that need to be answered for VBS. There's games that need to be set up. There's various different areas just within VBS alone. It was through the grace of God that we were set free. But now we're called to use that grace, not harbor it for ourselves, but use it to share the light of the gospel to anyone, to anyone. And how do we do that? We, we learn what it means to be a living sacrifice. And at the end of Peter, it says, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And as it ends in Romans, it says, if I can find my place, this is your true and your proper form of worship. Every week I stand up here and I say, we're going to continue in our worship with the giving of our tithe and offering. I say that because this is what true worship actually looks like. When the body is willing to give up our own plans, our own agendas, our own finances even, things that may even hurt to give up, when we're willing to give them up because God said, I'm calling you now. This is what it means to worship as a body. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it many more times. It takes the giving and the sacrifice of those who know the Lord to save those who don't. And that's the calling that we have, church. To sacrifice all that we can to see new people in this church, to see new people come to Christ. That's the calling that we have been received. It takes the love and sacrifice of those who know the Lord to save those who don't. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this day that you've blessed us with, this beautiful Sunday morning. And God, I thank you for the word that you've given us. The word that you've given me. God, although it's not an easy thing, I pray that you will teach us what it means to sacrifice wholeheartedly. To give up the mind mentality, to give up what we crafted as mind from such a young age, God. To give it up and see what you can do with it when we're truly willing to sacrifice everything. God, we want to see your kingdom come. We want to see it here in Wor Worcester. God, we want to see it at VBS. We want to see you move. So I pray your hand over every sacrifice, Lord God, the big and the small. God, see it as worship for you and use it to bless your kingdom in ways that we cannot even imagine. In your name, and the church said, amen.
Guys, that's a record. It's 12.01. I made it. Like, come on. That's awesome. <laughs> that's all for me and Pastor Tom. But, hey, I'm happy about it. Guys, thanks for being here. I love you. Have a great week. And we will see you back next week as Pastor Tom continues in week four of the series Appetite. Have a good one. Pages are turning under the clouds. Got used to the hiding. Now you're feeding the doubt. Let me show you the silver lining. How to tame them and then to ride them. Cause you weren't meant to be caught counting days. That's not your place. Shout at the night, rage at the lies. Don't let the fear control. It's deep. 